Welcome back. This is part three of the video lecture series on obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. In this section, we are going to look at clinical presentation of these patients as well as uh, family components, and then we're going to expand beyond OCD to look at the related disorders. So we will first turn our attention to uh, the clinical presentation and note how families can accommodate to patients with these types of disorders. And this is something that you will pick up in your evaluation of patients with obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So family accommodation includes the family's participation or assistance in the patient's rituals. And this is present in about 60% of families who have a family member with obsessive compulsive disorder. Now this is in a sense understandable because the family witnesses the suffering the individual with the disorder has. And as a result of that, they try to be helpful in some way or another, and this can come out looking like ways in which the family accommodates the person to try to help them with the distress they're experiencing. So families with accommodation behaviors often experience their own anxiety, depression, distress, and a sense of burden related to the person who is suffering from the disorder. The presence of accommodation of the family or of a family member is associated with greater severity of the patient's symptoms and patient's poorer response to treatment. Um, and and it's, that's probably related one with the other because the more symptomatic a patient is, the more distress the family may experience and then the family gets caught up in trying to accommodate the patient. So family accommodation is one component of the clinical presentation and needs to be part of the treatment plan once we have taken a careful history. Now accommodating behaviors can include providing reassurance, participating in rituals, most frequently those associated with contamination, washing or checking. For example, I have a pediatric patient who has obsessive compulsive disorder and cannot go to sleep at night until everyone is settled into bed and then she has to get up and and check all the doors and windows to make sure that they're securely closed and locked and it has to be done in a particular order and her family accommodates to this by allowing her to do this and participating in these rituals so that the child can actually finally get to sleep. So you will see this as well as family supp uh, providing supplies for use in rituals, assisting in avoidance behaviors, or maybe assuming a patient's responsibilities and tasks so that they can participate in the rituals they may have. Families sometimes have to modify their work schedules, leisure activities, and the family relations in order to fit with the patient's rituals. And they can agree with the patient with regard to rituals because of fear of abuse if they do not. In other words, they're trying to spare the patient uh, more suffering um, and they worry about what will happen if they don't accommodate. Cle the key clinical features of obsessive compulsive disorder include recurring obsessions and or compulsions that cause significant distress or interfere with functioning occupationally, academically, or socially. Obsessions, remember, are those intrusive thoughts, ideas, images, impulses or doubts that the individual experiences in some way as senseless and that cause emotional distress. So patients that experience the obsessive obsessions are aware at some level that they are unrealistic and possibly irrational, but they can't stop that. And compulsions on the other hand are repetitive behaviors 
or mental rituals such as checking, washing, or praying, or some other ritual in response to, the, to an obsession. Patients with OCD also use what are called neutralizing strategies to reduce distress and to lessen the chance of a feared event occurring, even though, again, this is often illogical or nonsensical. Now, obsessions are preoccupations. They can be preoccupations with contamination, with symmetry, where objects have to be organized and aligned in a certain way in order to prevent something bad from happening. Um, they can have pathological doubting or uncertainty where there are concerns that as a result of their carelessness, they may be responsible for some dire event occurring. There can be somatic obsessions where the person is obsessed with the idea that they have something wrong with them physically and they can't stop thinking about it. This can also evidence itself with hoarding or obsessions that they're going to harm themselves or someone else even though they don't have any real intention of doing that. They can be preoccupied with sexual content or violent thoughts and they can have a sense that something unpleasant may happen if a particular ritual is not performed. Obsessions are usually around one of the following areas, contamination, pathological doubt, symmetry, or somatic obsessions. Contamination obsessions are the most frequent of the obsessions that we encounter. They're usually a fear of dirt or germs, but this can include fear of things in the environment such as toxins or bodily waste, or sometimes I've, I've had a patient that was convinced that he had been exposed to HIV and was going to have uh, an HIV infection, and in spite of multiple HIV tests, he could not come to the understanding that he really did not have HIV. And they often will fear that there'll be some harm to themselves or that they'll, that this, some type of contamination will make them ill. Patients use avoidance to prevent contact and they can often use excessive washing as a way to deal with their contamination uh, fears. Pathological doubt is when patients have a concern that they will cause a dire event by their carelessness in some way or another. They worry about leaving the stove on and causing a fire that may destroy the house. So they may check the house a number of times. They leave, they're on their way to work, and they feel compelled to turn around, go back to the house, and make sure that all the burners are off and the toaster's unplugged and so on and so on. So they may doubt their own perceptions that they've already checked everything and that, that there is no problem. They often use checking rituals and may use avoidance behaviors such as not leaving the house so there is no possibility of leaving it unlocked or of uh, having a fire. So the need for symmetry is the need for things to be arranged perfectly or to perform actions in exactly the right sequence. These patients with a need for symmetry have an urge to repeat actions that they feel didn't occur just right or just in the right order. Some patients with obsessions have magical thinking accompanying them, so they fear the consequence to loved ones if they don't order things in just the right way or arrange things in just the right way that something bad might happen to one of their loved ones and it will be their fault. Some patients have obsessive slowness. They may take much, a much longer time to perform a task than is necessary and each small step of a task must be done perfectly. They can lose track of the bigger goal that needs to be achieved and this can result in tardiness and problems with work and occupational academic functioning. Um, these patients with the need for symmetry describe feeling uneasy 
rather than fearful or anxious when things are not arranged just so, and have increased uneasiness or a sense of tension until they perform the acts of ordering or arranging things so that they're done perfectly and in the right order, or they may feel the need to even up by performing the same act on both sides of an object. This sensation of uneasiness is more similar to that of individuals with tics than to anxiety of other subcategories of obsessive compulsive disorder. So patients with extreme perfectionism or obsessional slowness may not respond to behavioral therapy alone. Now somatic obsessions is, is another component that we need to be aware of where somatic obsessions are irrational fears of developing a serious life-threatening illness like HIV or that there's some other medical problem that people are missing that they fear will result in them having a bad outcome. So they often use checking rituals such as checking the body for signs and symptoms of illness they may uh, frequently want to get tested for cancer, venereal disease, and HIV, but unfortunately they're not reassured when the results come back negative. Now hoarding is another problem that exists within the obsessive compulsive spectrum, and human hoarding does not usually involve hoarding of food, but tends to involve hoarding of non-food items. Most commonly, Hoarded items are newspapers, magazines, junk mail, old clothes, lists, notes, old receipts. The underlying problem here is that there is a fear that they may dispose of something that they will later regret, and the decision of discarding something useful is, is problematic or that they might need in the future. Hoarding as an obsession occurs in about 11% of children with OCD and among 18 to 42% of adults with obsessive compulsive disorder. Patients with hoarding obsessions and compulsions are likely to have comorbid diagnoses of tics, social anxiety, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So when we are doing an evaluation of someone presenting with these symptoms, we need to also evaluate for these common comorbid diagnoses. Patients with hoarding obsessions have more severe OCD symptoms and greater disability than patients with other obsessions. Hoarding is often associated with impaired social and vocational functioning. So let's turn our attention to treatment and consider pharmacotherapy. Uh, pharmacotherapy for OCD with hoarding includes the use of SSRIs which tend to have to be at higher doses than we might usually anticipate for the treatment of say a, a generalized anxiety or a major depressive disorder but we don't start at the higher dose we have to titrate ever so slowly. Um, hoarding has been found to be associated with a poor response to SSRIs however and that is an unfortunate um, problem which we're hopeful in research will improve as we get a better understanding of the underlying pathophysiology. If there is no response to SSRIs at the right dose and, and uh, perhaps um, using specific SSRIs such as Luvox or even the tricyclic antidepressant, clomipramine, we may need to add a, uh, a typical antipsychotic such as risperidone or olanzapine used at a low dose as an adjunctive medication because remember that we're, we're thinking that there is a, uh, an imbalance in both serotonin and dopamine. If this is not effective, a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor may also be used. So the treatment for, in terms of therapy is cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. The treatment of hoarding disorder should include the following components. 
psychoeducation with the patient about hoarding to increase their insight and motivation, and, and especially explaining the biological underpinnings, to facilitate the patient's awareness that they must make decisions to organize, store, and or discard the hoarded items, and to be taught how to do that in a step-by-step -step fashion, to help patients reduce incoming clutter at the same time, to teach patients how to organize their belongings, tasks, and time, and help the patients to identify activities to replace the hoarding behavior and collective collecting activities so that they're not left with a hole uh, in, in their psychosocial functioning um, where they feel compelled. So the multiple component CBT model has evidence for the treatment of uh, hoarding and that includes uh, addressing information processing deficits, uh, problematic beliefs and behaviors, which you know you can get at with cognitive behavioral therapy, but also appreciating the emotional distress the person is experiencing to identify and address the avoidance behaviors, and then the identifying the strong negative emotional reactions to possessions, which can generate anxiety, grief, and guilt uh, which leads to avoidance of discarding and organizing things. And then strong positive emotions, the joy, pleasure, excitement, and euphoria, which can reinforce the saving behaviors and the, the acquiring of possessions. So another piece of the multi-component multi CBT model is um, <clears throat> the motivational interviewing which is used during the assessment and when needed for homework non-compliance and attendance problems and uh, attending therapy unfortunately it's not uncommon for patients with OCD to tend to want to avoid psychotherapy because it may provoke some distress in terms of feeling they have to change some of the behaviors which they may be quite reluctant to do um, cognitive skills training is important by providing strategies in organizing, decision making, and problem solving. Pat, uh, patients are gradually exposed to non-acquiring and discarding situations, which is a, an exposure component, and cognitive therapy, which is provided for problem hoarding relevant beliefs that need to be um, addressed in terms of cognitive distortions. Um, strategies for managing stressors without the use of hoarding behaviors need to be developed for each patient individualized in an individualized fashion. So the outcomes of this model are that patients with severe clutter or physical limitations receive one or two sessions of three to six hours each in which the therapists and others help the patient in sorting, organizing, and discarding. And these sessions occur late in the therapy program after the patient has learned how to organize, make decisions, and discard things. The sessions are directed by the patient, much as you have learned in your study of cognitive behavioral therapy, where agendas are set near the beginning of the session. In comparison to patients on a wait list, 70% of those who received 26 weeks of the multi-component CBT intervention had significant improvement in symptoms of hoarding. Only 24% were rated as very much improved, however, demonstrating that this is a recalcitrant, difficult to treat problem. The researchers note that about 37% of those with hoarding problems declined to participate in the intervention. They just didn't or couldn't proceed because of their obsessions and com uh, the compel compelling uh, factors. So the compulsive hoarding is a chronic illness. It tends to begin early in life. The onset of symptoms and exacerbation of symptoms have been found to be linked with stressful or traumatic life events, and the symptoms tend to get worse over time without treatment. Compulsive hoarding is associated with high rates of comorbid psychiatric and medical problems and impairment of family, social, and vocational functioning. CBT that uses an exposure and prevention of response approach 
is helpful in obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. This includes educating patients as, it, it, such as those with hoarding and it, to increase their insight and motivation to facilitate the patient's awareness that they must make decisions, organize, store, and discard hoarded items, and assisting the patient to reduce incoming clutter. Education of the patient and the family about how to organize their belongings, tasks, and time is important, and assistance for patients to identify activities that replace the hoarding and collective activities are important because it's not right to take something away from someone without giving something back. So in terms of sexual and aggressive obsessions, patients fear that they may commit a sexually inappropriate act or harm someone else. They may fear that they have already committed such an act even though there's no real history of that. They watch reports of unsolved murders on television and may uh, make them that may make them very anxious and they tend to use checking seeking reassurance and confession even to police and priests about things that they think they might have done that they actually haven't done so you can understand how painful this is in terms of an obsession um, they may use avoidance behaviors such as removing sharp knives and scissors to reduce their fear that they may hurt someone else they may also think that they deserve to be punished, even though in reality there is no history of them actually acting out on any of these obsessions. Um, with regard to compulsions, compulsions can include repetitive be physical behaviors and or mental rituals. These include, as you know, checking, ordering and arranging things, counting things, repeating things, cleaning, hoarding and collecting, repeating specific prayers or protective thoughts, um, the need to ask for help, the need for reassurance, and the feeling that they need to confess something that they may have done, as well as mental compulsions such as silent counting, reviewing, or praying. So neutralizing strategies that patients tend to use include in addition to the compulsion, repetitive and ritual behavior, some individuals with OCD use what are called neutralizing strategies to reduce distress. And these strategies include seeking reassurance from others, overanalyzing things, rational self-talk, replacing a bad thought with a good thought, performing brief mental or behavioral acts to remove the thought, and using distracting activities and thought stopping techniques. <clears throat> the differential diagnosis to be considered when we are evaluating patients with obsessive compulsive and related disorders include evaluating for Tourette's syndrome, trichotillomania, kleptomania, hypochondriasis, panic disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is more likely to have restricted affect, excessive devotion to work, professionalism, perfectionism, and rigidity may be the prominent symptoms that do not rise to the level of obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as uh, in OCD obsessions, which are preoccupying, distressing, and impair function. So this ends part three of the video lecture series. I thank you for your attention and invite you to view the final video lecture in this series, which follows in the module.